Well, it says 10 o'clock on my phone, so I'm going to go ahead and get the meeting started. Uh, Happy New Year's to everyone, and a Happy New Year, and uh, hope everybody has a blessed one. And uh, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. And first thing on the agenda is well, uh, roll call. Everybody taking care of that, right? Yeah. And we're going to introduce some uh, new board members here today. And what I'll do is uh, have you introduce yourself. And if you want to say a couple of things, you're welcome to them. <laughs> Put you on the hot seat right away. Good morning, my name is John Higgins, brand new village board. Looking forward to uh, getting to know everybody and doing service to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi, Eric Brack. Um, thank you for nominating me and selecting me for this service, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Welcome, you. Okay. I'm Ann Coakley, and uh, ditto. <laughs> Happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to it, huh? Okay. And then we'll go and introduce the uh, other board members in a minute. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, what are we at here? Tier. Tier. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was another one. <laughs> yeah, my name is Maria Guadalupe Garcia, and Cortez is for my daddy. So my daddy, the last name of my daddy is uh, Cortez. So I choose Garcia for my husband. <laughs> yeah, and um, I'm glad to be here, and I thank you for inviting me. Okay. okay. And I think most of you know me because I was on the interview committee, but I'm Art Quintana, and my sixth year on the on the board here, mm -hmm. and I will be conducting the meeting today. My name's Arlene Zordman. Uh, I've been on here about six, seven months now. Um, that's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, go ahead with. Oh, Lonnie Dooley. I've also been on the board about six, seven months, so Arlene and I were the newbies before you guys came on board. Okay, and want to introduce yourself? Sheila. Yeah, I, I'm Sheila Conroy, and I've been on the board about four years. I think I've just been told I have to, I'm no longer on the board at the end of 2025, so. Whatever that means, I've been I've been here for four years, or so. and it's really good to see these new people. It's yeah. getting a bit bored seeing the same faces around. The table. <laughs> yeah, nice having a hair. Same so, table well, here. Ronnie, you want to? Yeah, uh, Ronnie Main is senior services manager. I officially started my second year in this role as of December twenty seventh, I think. So I, well, I, I had a lot less gray hairs on my face. <laughs> yeah. but, but. It's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah. right. well, I'm okay. excited to work with all of you. Yeah. Good. You. Yeah, I'm Marsha Martin. I am the city council liaison to this board, and I have been for six years. Two years to go. So, it's, yeah, this is the, we, we switch them up sometimes when, um, there's a new city council election, so we just had one, and I got to keep you guys. And that means I get to keep you all the way to the end. Yay, good. <laughs> I love this board. Thank you. Jeff? My name is Jeff Friesner. I'm the director of uh, recreation and culture. And uh, uh, fortunately, I was lucky enough to, to hire Ronnie, and uh, I'm here to support him for a few more months. And then I, I think Ronnie will be ready to, to do his own thing, and I'll go back and do my thing. Um, hmm. well, we'll miss you. Yeah. All right. And <laughs> my, my, my Robin. 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 I'm Robin Bosica. I'm the admin assistant here at Social Media Okay. And Mr. Dave. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> Introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Dave Brenna. I'm a citizen member today. Uh, I was on the board, and uh, and I wasn't quite elected or nominated and approved, I guess, by the city council. So it was just an oversight. But I'll be back as a member at the 
the next meeting. So I can't vote today. I can talk, you know, but that's that's about uh, that's about it. I do have some things to say. And uh, am I the last one? Yes. Maybe before you go any further, if you would let me read a letter from Beth Bowles. She asked me to read her resignation letter. Okay. Uh, from the floor. And uh, so this is last October. Beth Bowles was uh, on the board. A very, very good member, I thought. Anyway, she said, uh, uh, Ronnie Dave and Senior Citizen Advisory Board, I regret to inform you that I am unable to fulfill the remaining two years of my three-year term on the Senior Citizens Advisory Board. Please consider this email as notice that I am resigning my board member position effective December 31st, 2023. I am thrilled that our, there were six applicants for this board's vacant positions. This has made my decision to let go of some of my commitments of this is much easier. It has been a pleasure working with all the talented board members and staff, which you know all the very best, sincerely, Beth Falls. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. And that you appreciated her. She was yeah. really vocal yeah, and sure. had a lot of input, mm -hmm. good ideas. <clears throat> okay. Next, uh, the orientation manual you Who's giving that one? I'm just we're passing them out, and I think it's an opportunity for us to kind of just go through all of these. Yeah. Yeah. If I ever got out, <laughs> I never got out. <laughs> We'd see each other. Get it done. Yeah, that's funny. That's right. I can't. Yeah. Oh, Dave has. Yeah. Well, that's yours, Dave. Yeah. What's that? That's, that's yours. Yeah. This is not mine. on the Sheila's. Yeah. That's mine. And that one's yours. Okay. And then I'll hang on for Sheila. All right. You don't, want to, Thank you. you don't want to hand it to her? Oh. <laughs> we'll deliver it this afternoon. <laughs> she wants you to toss Run. it over to her. Can, can you hear us? Go ahead. Can, can I say something? I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I found my folder um, before I came away when I was tidying up my home office. So I don't need a second folder. Okay. And I promise I will read it when I get back. So thank you for thinking of me. Is there any changes from the last one we had? Um, there are some updates. Okay. <coughs> there are some yeah. updates. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so. Yeah. And we are providing this as background information for the board. Um, Want to make sure that uh, the new me board members start out with as much information as possible. Um, we'd encourage you to read through it. I think one of the most important sections in there is uh, uh, your responsibilities as uh, appointed to the board uh, by the municipal code. And uh, there's also contact information for all the other board members. And uh, what uh, for the, the new board members, Ronnie and I will be scheduling meetings with you um, to kind of bring you up to speed with what's going on with the board with the uh, how quickly this uh, meeting was after the new year we really didn't have time to to schedule that but we will do that before the next meeting and uh, thank you for um, being on the board and if you have uh, any questions in between meetings please don't hesitate to reach out to Ronnie or I the um, contact information is not in there yet. Do you want to gather the new information? Okay. So, yep. so new board members, I'll collect your information at the end of this uh, this meeting. And in February, we're going to identify uh, positions uh, for this board. So I'll collect information. February, I'll identify that. And then I'll send, send that out to everybody for us to add it to um, this, this binder. And 
normally that that you appoint a chair and vice chair at the first meeting but because of the unique issue with, uh, with Dave this time we thought it would be best to wait till the February meeting and then have that election then. I'm glad to hear that and one, one thing I forgot to say is welcome to the new board members we're happy you're here and uh, we really look forward to working together as a, as a board here thank you for that. Okay, approval of the agenda. Do I need a motion on that? Or November, November 1st. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, for the agenda. Oh, yeah, the see. agenda. Do we need a, a motion? Do we need a motion? I make a motion. I'll second. Okay, motion and second for the agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed? No, good. Okay. Approval of previous minute, uh, month minutes. Yeah, the November meeting. And uh, of course, the new board members, more myself, more myself were, were not here, so. Yeah, I guess Marlene, you were here. Right. I was here. Yeah. 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 That's why I said it's going to have to be you. What do you think? <laughs> okay, um, I move that we approve the minutes from November 1st, 2023. All right, good. Moved and second. Anybody here from the public to be heard? Besides Dave? <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll just jump in when I got something. What's that? I'll just jump in when I got something. You so. bet. Okay. Okay. I've got something to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I hesitated a little bit. <laughs> uh, some, of the, some of your folks have heard me pontificate before, but um, I just wanted to, as part of the orientation, I think there's something the new members should know what, what we've been doing over the last year and what we're hoping to do over the next few months. Uh, in, in, your, in your manual and in the minutes, uh, the city ordinance is listed as far as what are the goals and objectives of, of this board. And you can read that and study it for yourself. But we're going to change the way we make our, re our report to the city council this year as opposed, as opposed to uh, previous years. Um, I think. <clears throat> Go on a blank here. Um, pardon me. Just go. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Um, did, did you want to talk further about? No, I, I, I remember okay. what I was. Okay. Now. Yeah, I didn't have a lot of sleep last night. I guess that's the problem. Anyway. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on over the last year is I, I was talking about the, the direction that we want to take the board and the things that we want to do. Uh, I think that the, uh, you know, I'm just going to pass for the moment. I'm going to pass for the moment. I'm going to pass for the moment. Okay. Okay, we're we'll going to old business committee reports. Arlene? So I uh, sent, I included a copy of the um, report. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because we're always running out of time, I thought it would be easier that way. If, any, if you guys read it and you have any questions, um, <clears throat> you know, I certainly will try to answer them. So I think there are some areas that, as, as advocates, we needed to look at advocating for the seniors. And one of them is reach the microtransit. Um, and there's there's like a little blurb on that about that. I think we need to advocate that it be either free or extremely low cost. Um, otherwise, it's not going to be beneficial for a lot of the seniors who are on low income. Um, the mobility hub is kind of an interesting thing. It's going to be out on I-25 in Colorado 19, 119. Um, like you can catch. The bus to Denver, you can catch the bus to Fort Collins, Loveland, wherever. 
Um, that's something that will be completed in the fall of 24. Um, this one really excites me, the Front Range Proposed Railroad, railroad Passenger Train, which will go from Pueblo onto to Fort Collins. And granted, it's going to be probably 10 years, if not longer, um, in the making, but at least they received the money to take a look at it and say, we've found the route we want, which is the uh, route right now that the railroad goes through town. And it goes through all of the towns. If they take that route, it will probably be Amtrak that does the rail, the passenger rail. Um, we are going to have a hub here. I think that it easily Longmont will be able to say, we want the train to stop. And that way we can, I mean, if you want to go to Denver, my thoughts on this are, if I want to get on that train here in Longmont, ride to Denver, <clears throat> the cost that I'm paying for that train, I want that cost to take me from onto the light rail in Denver to the airport. Um, and I think that's something that we need to think about for the future. I don't know what that passage is going to you know, require, whether we would have to pay an additional amount um, or what that would be. And how long is the pass going to be good for? Is it going to be good for 24 hours? Is it going to be good for, you know, if I want to go down there and spend two, three days down there? Um, is it, am I going to have to pay again to come back? So I think those are things that we need to think about over the next 10 years. Um, questions that we need to ask uh, because Somewhere or another, it needs to be functional for us. Get on that thing, get where we want to go, and not have to pay $100 or $150 to do it. Because then you defeat the purpose of driving. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my two cents. Um, the grocery shopping thing I wrote a little bit about. Um, and the design for 119, um, there's a lot going on there, and there just wasn't a whole lot that they were talking about. So I think we just keep on top of what's going on there which will be probably a little bit of disruption to our lives if we're headed to Boulder. Um, that is a diagonal. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then I... I need us. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have seen the lights on Main Street, those new installed lights working, and I'm very impressed with them. People actually are seeing them, stopping for them. Um, they're being able to get across the street, and so I think that that's really great. Um, one thing I thought about that I didn't put in there, which I noticed when I was sitting at 21st in Maine, is <clears throat> some of the lights that are down here in downtown when you go across Main Street, both directions of traffic, all four directions of traffic stop, and then the walk light goes on before the, any of the traffic is allowed to go. I think we need to take a look at expanding that all the way down Main Street. Because um, I noticed at 21st in Maine the other day, the people that were going to cross the street, the minute the light turned green for me, the light turned for them. If we give them just that two or three or four seconds time to start getting across the street, it gives them the ability to, to at least get, get moving and cars can see them or they should be able to see them. But I think that's something we need to take a look at and I don't know how we would advocate for it, but I would say even down when I've been down on Pike at Quail, down there, those streets, they, people need the ability to be able to get across before traffic starts going. So I think we take a look at all the way from Pike and Quail down there up to 66 and maybe even just that street like you had 66. And mm -hmm. I think it's a computer thing. Yeah. It, it is a computer thing. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you have to upgrade the individual light appliance mm -hmm. uh, so they can talk to the computer system and so the city is replacing them within the confines and constraints of its budget and what everybody can do is to write a letter to Mr. Jim Angstad oh, yes. and um, maybe we can put that in next in the minutes his, his email address mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um, and just say how important it is to seniors well, I think it's important to everybody. If you've, got, if you've got a family and they're trying to walk three or four right. kids across, right. I think they need to be able to get across before traffic just all of a sudden starts going. Especially if there's a baby carriage. Oh, home. yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Just the same as a walker. You know, any right. mobility device can yeah. slow you down just enough to have you in the middle of the street with traffic coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that's one of the things I thought of afterwards. I, I thought we, we need to take a look at <clears throat> 
and yeah. as far as Jim Angstead goes, this is something kind of off the track, but I believe he does Vision Zero, and yes. I was wondering yes. if we would like to have him attend one of our meetings and explain mm -hmm. to us, Jim Angstead, oh, yeah. um, explain to us what Vision Zero really is all about and how Longmont is incorporating it into the, our area. And I would be glad to ask him to come if that were if that's a possibility. So. Um, in terms of the implementation of Vision Zero, um, Phil Greenwald is sort of the design and visionary, whereas Jim is responsible for the implementation, and he's the guy that like decides where the light goes and stuff. He's engineering. So if you want to know the ideas behind it, Phil would be a better explainer. Um, and uh, we can. We could get both of them. That'd yeah. be fun. Yeah, I think it. I think it would. We yeah. can, we'll, we'll reach out to them and get yeah. them on an agenda. That'd be great. Yeah, because I think it'd be nice to hear. Yes. Excuse me. It, what's Jim's last name? Angstad. A N G S T A D T. Thank you. Does he think I've run that transportation? That's That's Phil. Phil. That's Jim terrible. Jim was at our meeting a year ago, a little over a year ago. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And the only thing uh, I was going to say is that as as we look at at the future with uh, the light rail train, whatever we want to call it, mm -hmm. is that uh, it'd be great to see if we're going to have that opportunity of having. A monthly pass, which would get us right. any of us for I don't know if you mentioned that or not. I missed it. But yeah. yeah, I I didn't mention. I think I mentioned it in my um, write up, right. but I don't think I mentioned it when I. Yeah, and I think Phil Greenwald is the one that that we would be talking to about that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I read that. It's been a little while, but for, was it sixty six and uh, I twenty five, or was it one nineteen? One nine, not for the the bus. Yeah, one nineteen. One nineteen and and yeah. Two, and yeah. Okay. So the hub that we're talking about in Longmont is that around First and Main, where they where they're eating up all that property so quickly. But there mm -hmm. is room for something here, like a station or something. That's been uh, on the city plan for years, yeah. and just waiting for funding. Hmm. Okay. Two, about ten years. <laughs> so it'd be like across the street from uh, some from 300 Sons. Yeah, across the street from, from, from the big apartment building, literally. That's why it's called that. Mm -hmm. um, Main Street Station. So it's just yeah. there. Yeah. Old bus station. Just there. Anybody else have any questions? No, but I got a comment. I'll come back to you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a good thing. Okay. Can't get out of the habit there. <laughs> it's a great system. Uh, last, last year, I think it was uh, in May, we had uh, Harold come to our meeting. And we, uh, I shouldn't say complain, but we laid out a number of issues that we thought were important, primarily staff. And he listened to us, and uh, I think it helped getting some additional staff, some additional resources. And we'd like to do the same thing this year. And that's, I asked Ronnie uh, just before the meeting if we could get Harold to come to the meeting in March. Now, I don't know if he's available or not, but it would sure be nice if we could get him, or if not in March, April at the latest, so we could make a similar kind of presentation. But the reason I'm a little anxious is because it's, Time is getting short as far as get, making a recommendation to the city council. We're trying to, I was saying that we were trying to fit into, we're trying to change the way we did the recommendations. We're trying to fit into the budget cycle. The budget cycle starts in March. So if we want to have any impact on what's going on with the city, staffing, <coughs> resources, money, whatever, we have to get our stuff in the mix early. So that's why I, I feel a sense of urgency uh, and that's why I would like to get uh, Harold here on uh, March, preferably, or April, and if he won't come, I don't know, we've got something of a problem, I guess, but... Now, coming to you, I think... Uh, <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> coming to your report, I thought that was just excellent. And I think that we could take 
what, I, what I'm saying is that I think that we could take your report almost as is, and that would be included as our, our recommendation to, uh, to Harold and then to our report to the City Council. And maybe, maybe change a few things here and there, and maybe next meeting we could all vote on whether or not we agree with this recommendation or parts of it or not all of it. But as far as I can see, we could basically, that would be our recommendation of, uh, for the next budget year. Then, as far as housing is concerned, and, and uh, Sheila, same thing. I don't know what you're going to talk about today, but by next meeting, uh, we should be able to say, you know, these are the kinds of things that we've come up with, and these are the kinds of things we want to recommend to Harold, and then subsequently in a letter to the city council. Okay. And then, uh, as far as outreach, I've got some things to say about outreach a little bit later. But the, the same thing would apply to outreach. And we have stuff in motion already, and maybe today you could talk a little bit about that and bring the newer board members up to speed as far as what, what you've done when, when we get to that item on the agenda. So that's that's the sense of urgency. We've got this meeting, we've got the next meeting, and if we can get Harold here by the first of March, first meeting in March, uh, that's that's going to be kind of make our presentation. Then we start over for the next year. Yeah. So I have a question for Marsha, um, and I I know you said that we present these things to the council, but what is better received by the council? Some paper copy or people actually showing up at the meeting and saying these are our recommendations or this is the way that we would like to go in the future or both? Um, well, it's always good to have backup, mm -hmm. um, but the impact is presenting at the council and also having people show up and speak in public invited to be heard in support of the presentation. So the more um, the more you can muster, and that doesn't mean filling up public invited to be heard with 27 speakers, but it could mean having 20 people show up wearing the same color and having three speakers um, you know, just really a show of support is the most influential thing on council. And, and when would that be, you know, just timing-wise, would that be like May? You know? mm. Earlier. Well, April? April? Yeah, meeting. and as, as early as possible when we're ready, um, you know what, there's, there's a process that you follow to get on the agenda, correct, Ronnie? And so I think um, when Ronnie, who has a report for the agency, you know, for the senior center, and the board are both ready, then he makes the request. But it's good to do this early in the budget cycle so that um, both the council and um, the uh, financial department, the people who do these weighted works, um, uh, in terms of deciding what gets funded and what can't be funded, you know, what we have to do is establish the need case. Mm -hmm. And the more strongly we establish the need case, then the more likely we are to get the funds that we need to do the work we, we, we want done. And there's two uh, aspects to that. One is showing public support, and one is showing that we have a firm plan so that you know we can it's something that we collectively the senior center and its advisory board can execute on so those are the objectives and um, I'm sure Ryan knows that better than I do but um, you know but that's what if we if we you know last year we did a really I thought fine job of, of going over ways that the senior center can extend its reach to uh, different uh, se segments of the community that are not as well served as, uh, you know, the ones you see when you walk through here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we talked about, you know, extended hours, um, which requires more staffing because the people that are on the staff now are busy, right? They don't have more time to just hang around here. 
Um, and, uh, and we talked about outreach and we talked about learning from the community what different services are helpful. Um, but if they don't have a building to come to, it's hard to offer those different services. So those were all just for the benefit of the noobs here. Um, those are all things that we talked about doing. Um, I'm really excited about those ideas because that's our job, right? Is to serve as many people as possible and to serve them with what they need. Um, so that's the strategy for getting it, is just what David said. I was gonna say what she just said. <laughs> I agree with all of that. Well, I think it's important we get our ducks in order. That's what I'm trying to do here, you know. Get, you know, we know what we want to do, and then we push it through the system or you know, IT side. So that's, uh, so that's all I got to say. Well, and even if we don't get what we're asking for, right. it has been presented. The next year it can be brought to Push it again. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, right. Right. we got to make a start somewhere, right? right. So, so the uh, benchmark dates. Budget starts to gather information in March. What happens? What's the cycle after that? I can I can go over that if you want. So generally, the during the month of April and May, staff does uh, our requests for both capital improvement projects and the operating budgets. Which is people mostly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the end of May, um, staff. Uh, can no longer make our request, that's when it comes to an end. Um, generally, sometime in June, the city manager and the finance staff uh, schedule a meeting with us to review our requests. It's our opportunity as staff to explain why uh, what we're asking for is, is so important. From there, Harold, the city manager, uh, and the finance staff uh, put together a, a budget that is presented to City Council by the end of August. And then City Council usually in September conducts their budget and capital improvement uh, uh, budget hearings so that um, staff is given the opportunity to share the need with council members as well as with the public. It's the first time that uh, the public uh, gets to hear what's in the proposed budget. Council in, in uh, uh, October conducts a, a couple of public uh, hearings where the public can give comment. And then usually uh, end of October, first part of November, the council approves the budget in, on two readings. And then it's set to go uh, for the next year. At uh, that point, there was just the tinkering stuff. Over here. Yeah, one, once it gets to uh, being presented to City Council, I would say it's 90, 95% set with Council having a little bit of flexibility to, to add or, or take away. But really, your opportunity as a board uh, really needs to be shared, uh, your comments and March or April, or or you've really missed out on the budget cycle for that next year. Mm -hmm. Council could upset the whole apple cart in October or November. It has that power. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in general, we are responsible people who care about the operations of the city, so yeah. we don't. Yeah. Um, you know, something would have to be really terrible. Um, yeah, that that's a great point because. Council uh, makes all the decisions, and if yeah, if they don't agree with something that uh, the city manager or finance uh, department is has uh, put in, then things could get uh, readjusted. But uh, in in my 25 years with the city, I've never seen that happen. Uh, I I think that um, if council has issues, they they voice that early in the process so that uh, decisions can be made uh, to to meet their 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 needs. And it was this was not done by council specifically, but probably the most disruption there's ever been to a budget was in 2008 2009 when we had the Great Recession, and yeah. we couldn't afford we didn't have yeah. enough revenue. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. to continue with the plan as it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was the year the ice rink was was going to be scrapped and then in the midst of it being cut from the budget to a new uh, council being elected, it was it was put back in the budget and we had two weeks to get it operational. That was, uh, I had a full head of hair before. <laughs> That's not true. I haven't had a full head of hair forever. <laughs> Great. I don't know if there's any other discussion on that. If not, we'd like to move on, but thank you for that report. And thank you for that. was a great report. report on and I guess the question I have is as far as uh, would it be you, or Jeff, or who would be con contacting the Herald to find out who made it to a mark? I'll do that. Okay. Harold is the city manager. Yes. Yeah, yeah I think it'd be good for him to hear what we have to say and to meet as a, meet some of you folks. Too. I, I thought it was quite good last year. Yes, it was. It very informative. He can often share things going on in the city right. too that we may not fully know about. You know, he can fill us in on things and let us know what the latest and greatest is. So. Okay. Okay. Housing. Uh, Ronnie and Sheila. Hey, Sheila. Do you want to go first, or do you want me to? I'll go first. Okay. I don't have a lot to say. Um, and first, I want to congratulate Arlene. She, the report that she gave today and in the past have been really comprehensive and creative. Um, so I want to give her my congratulations on that. Um, the one thing that we found about housing is that it affects even every aspect of society in, in Longwood, um, from the, the young to the very old. But then we're trying to concentrate on the, the older section. And what I'd just like to do um, in this piece is to bring you up to date on what I have been doing over the last month. And then um, we'll give a fuller report next month or whenever is appropriate. So um, one of the good discussions I had was with, with a local realtor who is... Um, and a senior, let's see, senior real estate specialist, which is something from the um, National Board of Realtors that gives um, a, a, a certification to realtors who specialize in serving older, older people. And they have, um, they have give, give help with flyers and brochures and so on and some webinars, some training, so that there are real realtors in Longmont and in fact internationally who specialize in um, serving seniors. And I think I thought that was a, an interesting and rather worthwhile um, uh, operation and um, we should probably look out for that if and when we have the need of a realtor or if anybody asks us for a recommendation. Um, I had spent some time um, in the planning department talking to a zoning specialist and it, it was, although she was extremely helpful, um, it was a little bit um, spiriting because zoning is A, extremely complex and B, extremely difficult to change once it's on the map. Um, she said that people are sometimes tempted to do what she called a clean sweep, get rid of all the zoning in the uh, in the city and then start start afresh. Not to not have zoning like a city like Houston, but to start again. But that you know, everybody agrees that's not what it's doing. So I need to, to really understand that a little more. Um, those are the only two interviews that I had before I came away. I have an interview set up with Wendell Pickett, who's a developer in Longmont, who some of you may uh, know or have dealt with. Um, he was, he's been associated with the LHA in his past and is extremely interested in making sure that his, his work, his, his developments and other people's um, take into account the needs of seniors. So 
I'm looking forward to having a good chat with him. Um, basically, housing shortage and affordability, as I said earlier, is in. It's the problem for all ages and, and all people of all state financial status in this city and in the nation. Um, I would love to think that I, well, uh, we were talk, you were talking about recommendations to the city council. I was desperately trying to think of some realistic um, changes or that we could offer to the city, to, uh, the city council to assist in senior living. But I haven't come up with, with anything yet. And I'm hoping Ronnie has, because she's a little more creative than I am. So, um, all the, and also the one thing is we're still waiting for a change to the, um, the homestead property tax exemption, which is, I know, um, an, an issue for uh, seniors who want to downsize because the, the issue of property taxes um, in their budget is often um, a major issue and they want the, they want to have what they feel is their right um, and not have to wait another 10 years to get that um, exemption so we will wait and see what happens uh, in looking at, into this it's been on the, uh, the state agenda for several years and nothing has um, has happened yet and uh, you'll remember this last election that was part of um, term, proposition H and yes and um, that was that went down as you may remember so um, I'm going to do more work on in the next few weeks, and Lonnie and I will come up with some some recommendations and some thoughts um, at the end of those few weeks. And I'll turn it over to Lonnie because I know she's been busier than I have been. So, before, Lonnie, over to you. Before we, uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah. Marcia yeah. Has yeah. A Just uh, because Sheila, you said you were looking for some recommendations. Um, I recently learned. A, an interesting statistic, which is, uh, you know, there's a, a housing needs assessment in Longmont um, and that says that we need thousands of units of uh, affordable and attainable housing just to meet the needs of the current people here who are either trying to downsize, who are inadequately housed, are in danger of losing their current situations, you know, just those without without growth um, considered at all. Um, and Sheila said she was looking for uh, zoning changes or city rec recommendations to the city. Recently, the city um, made a uh, concession mm -hmm. that said if you want to change a single family home into a uh, duplex, we'll waive the connect fee for water, which is like $25,000 that you wouldn't have to spend doing that conversion. And of course, there are many more fees and incentives that could be put in place to convert houses to duplexes. And if 6% of the single family homes in Longmont, this is the statistic, were converted to duplexes, it would meet our housing need assessment shortfall. Six percent. So a, a recommendation to planning and zoning would be to find ways to incentivize people to do that and um, make that maybe not even change the zoning, just make that a, a change to the definition of the zone so that you can do that in a single family neighborhood without getting the whole neighborhood riled up. Um, so take a look at that. You know, Wendell Pickett is an expert in that and a true philanthropist. So talk to him about that, and and he he'll, he'll have better ideas than I will about the pros and cons of that. Thank you, Marcia. And the other, th I'm, I was just thinking that when you said get the uh, without getting the neighborhood up and arms, it's 
there's a house converted. But supposing that half the houses on the block, and or let alone all of the houses on the block, decided to uh, become duplexes, I wonder what that would, um, that what reaction that that would um, take. Um, <laughs> That's I mean, I'm thinking, be a reaction. That's yeah. why it's not a snap decision. Well, I'm, just, I'm, yes. just, I'm just telling you, you know, it could be like, uh, you know, we can't control who owns the house, but we can say there can only be this many Airbnbs on a block, mm -hmm. and we do, you know, because so restrictions mm -hmm. of, of that, of how, you know, first come, first serve, how many uh, of these of duplex conversions could be on a, a single block in a single family neighborhood, we could do that, for example. So there are ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. and how many there ways are always ways. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and what, well, you said that. Does the city have any views on, I couldn't find anybody who did have that, but views on air, restricting Airbnbs? Is that being I mean, There are statutory re restrictions now. Um, yeah. You know what happens is, is it's on the books, but um, we don't have a lot of budget defo devoted to enforcing it. So people yeah. are supposed to register as Airbnbs, but they don't always. Yeah. Well, I'm Thank on you. It. I'm sorry. You have some more, Sheila? No, that's that's fine. That's me. Okay. Uh, I'll hand it to you. Thank you. Okay, um, I took the um, affordable housing angle of um, housing as far as I spoke to the people at the Senior Center, I spoke to the people at Hope for Longmont, and I'll think of another one. I have my report and I cannot access it. So what I'd like to do, I love the idea of your report, it was, it was a great report, plus I like the idea of getting it beforehand. Mm -hmm. So because everybody's getting a lot of information today, what I'd like to do is get the report out to everybody on email. And maybe we'll continue to do that. Um, give everybody a chance to read it before having it, you know, thrown at them at a meeting. Not thrown at them, but, you know, a lot of information given to people at a meeting. This way you can have a sense of what we're going to be talking about. So I'd like to get the report out to everybody. But briefly... I so, to Lonnie, the one, one thing I would just say is that the report really should go to, to Ronnie. Right. And then Ronnie will distribute. That way, everybody is reminded that we can't conduct board business through email. Okay. It has to happen okay. while we're all together. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. so. um, but I can do that. I can get you the report and then you can get it out to everybody. Yep. Okay. okay. I learned a lot at the Senior Center. I learned a lot with Hope. And basically, Longmont needs affordable housing. Um, Longmont needs affordable housing for people who are unhoused, who are trying to downsize, um, who are losing their properties because places are being sold or rents are going so high that people have rented for a long time and not finding they can't afford to, to stay where they're at. So there's a lot of things going on, and basically there's not a lot of inventory for people to be able to pick up less expensive places to live. So it was also brought up that what we need is affordable assisted living, um, a place that would take Medicare or Medicaid. Um, and just be affordable if, it, if you're not on Medicaid, but in affordable assisted living, because there are people now who, Sheila kind of took the aging at home aspect and what they go through when they're aging at home. But um, oftentimes, you know, people need the extra help, but they can't get it because assisted living is so expensive. So we're talking about affordable housing, we're talking about affordable assisted living, and just the situations that many people run into. Multi-generational families where grandparents are taking care of grandkids, and the senior center is asked to fill in services to help both, you know, each party on what they need. Um, I think the best, one of the best things we can do is really support the resource people here at the Senior Center. 
really see what we can do to help them um, with what they're getting the word out. And, you know, I don't know what we can do, but I think support of them would be really helpful because they were basically saying their hands are tied sometimes because all they can do is get people on waiting lists and then they sit there. Um, there are four places in Longmont that give out vouchers, housing vouchers, four times, I mean, yearly. Um, LHA does it. Um, Boulder County Partner, Housing Partners does it. And I can't remember the other two, it's in my report. But um, anything we can do to help make sure people know that they can, they can apply for these things, they can put in an application, they can find out if they're on the wait list, they can find out if they've made the lottery, things like that. You know, if we could just really help people out with getting the word around and have people more aware that these are available to them so they'll be looking for it and they won't miss deadlines and things like that. Um, with HOPE, they are now taking over emergency services from um, our center. Our center does no more, um, no longer does any emergency placement for housing and things like that. It's really more HOPE that's handling that whole thing. So they are trying desperately to get temporary housing for people who just really show up and say, I don't have a place to live, and then long-term housing. They're working on both of them putting people into permanent housing. So um, we discussed it at length, and uh, they really just need support. They need, if they're putting in ideas to the council or anything else, they need people to stand with them and say, yes, we support that, we think it's a good idea. You know, and so I don't know to what extent we can do that, but I certainly was, was surprised to hear how involved it can be, you know, with hope. Mm -hmm. um, LHA. LHA, for the last 10 years, all their building has been seniors for senior properties. So their new buildings, there's two going up right now, are for everyone. They are for young, I mean, they are for single people, couples, families, and seniors. You can apply for these places if you're seniors, it's just we are not specifically forced, you know, yeah. There's no priority. Um, so I would like to make sure that seniors are still being put on the list for these places and still getting the support they need. And I'm sure, you know, again, um, the Senior Center does such a great job on their own um, with their resource specialists. But if there's anything we can do to kind of keep an eye on things and make sure that seniors are being supported as much as everybody else, um, that would be a good thing too. So my report will say a lot more and you'll be able to read more about what's going on. But I think basically that's where we stand. We stand that people are not being able to leave where they're living and find an affordable um, cheaper place to live. They can't downsize. They can't, you know, they can't do things like that because it's just not possible. They want to hang on to where they're living because they're afraid that if they give it up, there's going to be no place to go. So um, because of the high cost of real estate, that's a huge issue, issue here. Um, and we have to really keep an eye on making sure that seniors are getting the support they need. And uh, like I said, Senior Center does a fabulous job of it. Mm -hmm. And um, Ronnie, anything we can do to help support that, you just let us know. Clarification mm -hmm. is all our the senior housing, are they all subsidized? Um, well, there's <laughs> levels of subsidy, right? So the um, all housing authority buildings are subsidized in some way through HUD and, and through uh, community block grants and um, there are many money funding sources both to get to for the capital to get them built and for operational help then um, in addition to that there are community choice housing vouchers which help individuals pay the rent 
that um, that you have to pay whether you have a voucher or not if you're going to live in a uh, housing authority building. So um, there are people living in the housing authority buildings who don't have vouchers who have enough income to pay the rent by themselves, and there are also vouchers that um, uh, that you can get to pay the rent. That was a lot more important than it used to be, uh, or it used to be more important than it is because now private uh, landlords are required to accept vouchers where it used to be that LHA was almost the only place that would take vouchers. You know, the in-between and a few other places would take vouchers, but now there are more places to spend your housing choice voucher than it used to be before. Okay. And I'd also like to acknowledge the work of the Housing Authority in recent years um, that they are, be, because they're doing a better job of administering the Housing Authority and making it um, uh, cost effective, mm -hmm. man, well managed, that HUD has been entrusting them with more, the ability to administer more housing vouchers so that slowly but surely the number of available vouchers is increasing. And, and uh, once you get approved for the list, or get your name on the list, how long are you, are you allowed to stay on that list? What do you do? They've, they've changed the policy and made it much clearer to people. You have to reapply every year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people thought they applied once and then they said, I've been waiting for eight years. We know you haven't. You fell out and you didn't know it. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it, you, you apply uh, and applying at one place doesn't apply you to the other places. So if you really anticipate needing housing support, what you want to do is go apply at LHA and at HSBC, and, or not HSB, Boulder Housing, Boulder County Housing Partners, and um, and I don't remember the other two either. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but Boulder County something. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. But let so, me just clarify this too, with LHA, when they have, you're put on a list, okay, and then there's a lottery, and then they go and they choose 20 people. And then you're informed that you're on the lottery and your names are taken off the list. With LHA, they continue on that list until they've gotten vouchers for everybody on it. So it's not a yearly thing you apply for. It's till the end of the list. And then they start another list and everybody applies again. And then they continue until they fill it. Um, the other places do. They have a yearly thing that you have to apply for every year. I believe that policy has changed. Where you do have to apply every year? You do have to apply every year. And but what has happened, and this I have this from a recent um, LA, the, the, count, the city council is also the um, board of directors of the housing right. authority now. Um, and so this was that they're reporting. What they have done was um, that, that that waiting list was really not managed very well by the previous administration, and yeah. so there was a lot of confusion. But they called every single name on that list and sent letters and established that the people were no longer waiting. And so they don't really have a waiting list anymore. You know, it's like really short. And um, and one of the things they've done is that you don't stay on the list for more than a year. And so, you know, when you're told when you apply that you have to apply again, this is not a forever thing. Okay. And, um, and that, if it, that that's just another, had to happen in the last year or so. Huh? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and that would actually be another good thing for us to be aware of. So we could have um, one of the leaders of the housing authority come and talk to us about how their system is working now. Oh. And the lottery system, well, that would be that's, else, right? whether they're no. on the lottery or not, they still need to reapply. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they could choose a few times during the year to pull names mm -hmm. off the lottery. Yes. Okay. okay. They could find that they have 50 vouchers coming in, and so they'll go for 50 names off the lottery list. Yeah. And I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that you're saying now letters and you're aware of that. Yes. But the other thing that you need to realize, if you're ever talking to anybody, is 
if your name comes up and they call you, you've got to be ready to move. Mm -hmm. Because if you're if you can't move within a short amount of time, it goes on to the next person. Mm -hmm. it, you know, so that's one of the things I think people don't understand. And I can understand that as well. If I have a lease on a place right now and it doesn't expire until, you know, June and you want me to move in now, I'll end up either paying for two different places or I'm gonna to have to pass it up at this point. So yeah, that's it. Did you go they off the list? Mm -hmm. No. Or did you stay on the list? Yeah. But you're not you're not getting a you place don't right get there. That. You, yeah. Right. You go kind of right. down to Yeah. Yeah. Although so, the other <clears throat> thing is you can't be charged double uh, the landlords can't collect double rent. So if you move out when you still got months on your lease, but then your landlord leases up mm -hmm. um, the next month, he has to stop charging you. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. okay. Dave, one, one question for uh, Ronnie. This is so complex and uh, it's beyond me. I think I know the answer to this, but does your, do your staff understand all of the complexities? Of, oh, yeah. yeah. They do. Yeah. Okay. So, so they do a good job of supporting um, so some of their clients with, with those communication pieces. There's that misunderstanding that once I'm on the list, I'm on the list. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so when there's no, so sometimes they'll get notification that um, person A is their 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 uh, application is about to expire that they need to reapply. They help uh, connect those dots, get a hold of that person, and let them know that they need to reapply. So they're up to speed, yeah. speed as far as all the angles that mm -hmm. yeah. so Ronnie was talking about. Mm -hmm. And as, right, and that communication of hey, you know, your name was called, like you you got to move now. Mm -hmm. um, Email sometimes emails change, phone numbers change, so it's a struggle to sometimes get a hold of these people. Yeah. And if they're not, if we're not, our our team is not able to get a hold of them, then sometimes it comes back on us. Well, it's your fault, right? It's like no, we're trying to help support you to to, to get this information to you that that you know your name was called, you were selected, um, or you need to reapply. So um, there there's some misunderstandings of what our staff role is in supporting. And that we're not in control of it. Sometimes there's a misunderstanding that we're in control, and it's like no, we're just helping communicate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're to support and help communicate the information we're receiving. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there, there is some. We run into that a lot. There's a lot of misunderstanding of what our role is in that support process. And uh, Ronnie, is uh, Hope still looking at homeless as well? Oh yes, still doing absolutely homeless. great, and they're picking up this other. Right. Great. Now yeah. they still only have the frontier. Um, church and you know they basically have mats and things on the floor um, they really need we need a homeless shelter along them you know we need a specific shelter freestanding buildings specifically for homeless and that way they can have services available and they can have support available um, showers anything you know but we really need that we really need that badly so Pauline, did you have? Yeah, can, I just want to say a couple of things and I'll say it really fast because I don't want to extend the meeting out forever. Going back to the HH, which did not pass, it's my understanding that the state legislature is looking at that beginning now. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think that we need to be aware of what they're talking about and where that's going because the portion in there that was critical for us was the <clears throat> homestead yes. and that they had said it will go with the person, not with the property. So if I'm in a home right now, if I have that homestead and I decide to downsize, I gotta wait 10 years to get that back again. But if they get it to the point where it goes with the person, then I can downsize and I've got that. You're paying it anyway, why not carry it forward? Okay, and so I think that we need to be aware and we, I don't know what whether the city or whether we need to just send something to them and say, we would like to see this carried on. You know, um, do we grandfather in the people that are already doing it? What do we do But that? The other thing is, is I don't know if you guys have ever got out to where the VA homes are, back behind um, Home Depot. I haven't actually visited inside any of them, but that is really a, really a unique facility out there. If you get a chance, go yes. visit it. Yeah, it's really neat. I Habitat for really Humanity is out there too, oh. so it's really neat. I'm going to be talking to the woman who's doing the BCP, is it called? Oh, yeah, that project. Yes. And uh, 
getting an idea of where they're at with it, you know, and how that was is working out. I noticed about three or four months ago this picture in the paper of the first person getting yeah. her key and being able to move into one of the tiny homes. And I thought yeah, that was it's a neat yeah. facility. That there. was a great thing. Yeah. Um, also, just to let everybody know, in my report from the Boulder <laughs> County Agency on Aging Committee, um, there is a prop. Uh, there is a uh, link to the Proposition HH and what has been um, done since then, what they did in special session and stuff like that, and some of it has to do with new um, property, you know, new laws. And so, if you want it, it just so happens that it's in the it's in the other report. But if you want to look at it, it may be um, may be giving you some good information on what the latest and greatest is. Mm -hmm. So, and it does um, briefly touch base on the Homestead Act. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's, if anybody has you have any more questions, that's my report, and I will get Ronnie a copy of it, and he can set it up. Did, did I hear Did I hear you right? We don't have a homeless shelter in town. No, no. we do not. No, we don't. Yeah. I should say, clarify. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. churches, that is, um, there is not a municipal homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. What the city does is pass uh, community block grants that come to the city um, to independent nonprofits like Hope to provide services to um, the neediest people. So home, Hope and there is also uh, Agape, there is Safe Shelter, which is, um, it's, it's, it's actually a stealth facility, nobody knows where it is. Yeah, right. And, and, uh, uh, for uh, victims of domestic violence, and they take single single parents with children. You don't have to be a woman um, if you are the victim of domestic violence and are displaced by it. Um, so there are a number of homeless shelters. There is not a municipal homeless shelter. Um, and I don't want to run the meeting out later, but the problem of homelessness is way more complex than we don't have a shelter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to take too much more time on this either, but, uh, you know, the one about affordable uh, assisted housing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the paper a few weeks ago, there was an article that, you know, your insurance doesn't pay any of the home care part of it. If, if you do it out of your home, you have to pay, and I know a gentleman that just recently had his wife taken out of a home, and he's paying three hundred dollars a day to uh, for that assistance. So can you imagine what it's going to cost if you try to put him in a an assisted living facility? So you know, and it's you know, a big when, one. That's a big one. When people want to age at home, well, they may have to have re um, renovations made to their or um, upgrades to their home environment for accessibility and things like that, they have to pay for that. Yeah. Um, if they have extra care for them, they have to pay for that. So, you know, aging at home is not as easy as it may sound. They may own the property, they may own their home right out, but <clears throat> the amount of expenses that they would have to look at um, moving forward um, could drain them and, you know, they may lose their home because they have to pay those those fees themselves. Well, and Boulder County also gives grants to companies yes. that will help with that. And I'm sure that your yes. resource people know that. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. You know, so if they do need something, they need a ramp, if they need bars, if they need yeah. something going on, Boulder County does have. If they can get in touch, yeah, if they can contact them, yeah. there are right. places that'll help. Yeah, and if, if the senior center does not have a resource list for that, it does need one. Yes, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah I, I know uh, uh, the woman who took care of my mother during her decline um, is now basically homebound. She lives in a mobile home just right over here on 16th. And uh, she got her bathroom remodeled, and she got the roof fixed, she got her ramp built, and she didn't have a dime, so she didn't pay a dime. And, and then her grants came through Medicaid, I believe. But yeah, there's there are quite a number of resources for 
so people don't lose their homes right. to that in particular. Mm -hmm. Is so, there a main office that you would, a main site you would go to to find out who mm -hmm. to go to? It would be the Boulder County <coughs> Aging, uh, Area Agency the Aging Office. Yeah. Do they have an office at the St. Brain Hub? It's St. Brain Hub. It says they do. It says they do, but I don't know that it's actually manned all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The unless there's someone else, any questions for you? Uh, is the outreach and program uh, program development? Uh, you know, the, the one thing that uh, you know it's always a big concern is are we meeting the needs of all the community as far as ethnicity, mm -hmm. etc. And uh, one of the things that uh, I don't know uh, if it would be wise to get some resource specialists in here and Valerie to hear a little bit from them as to how many you know that the numbers will come in because some people you talk to they say oh yeah they do have a lot of programs and uh, and they're the programs we have they, they are getting a good attendance but the other thing that I think is really important are there <clears throat> other programs that they that might be needed by them that we're not reaching you know and, and so I just like to see what uh, what we think about in the future having uh, the resource specialist uh, and Valerie because Valerie is doing some of that too, right? Correct. And then uh, at Dr. Maria, and uh, she was telling me that you know she volunteered here and she'd be happy to make phone calls and invite people uh, as well. So uh, you know we would really like to continue to expand in that area. And maybe we're meeting the needs of everybody. I don't know, but if we're, uh, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, we would sure like to, to to know. And like I said, one of the things that I do see is when they're coming for services, the resource specialists they're getting their they're getting their number of, of diversity there. But I'm not sure that some of the other programs are, and that's what we'd like to look at and talk about, and look more about. Do you have anything? Yeah, so that's good timing. So. Um, you know, the, the, our request for my request for 2024 was to bring an additional programmer and um, allow us to assess who we have on staff at that point to determine how we can increase Spanish programs specifically. Um, so what we have done is we just brought on Terry Calvin, who has been, been helping us in that part-time capacity um, to keep our programs afloat when we were when we had that had such high turnover. And so she applied for our full-time position. So what that allows us to do now is to not increase programs specifically, like our general programs, but allows us to be more intentional on Spanish programs now. So between uh, Amy Hodge, our, our our program supervisor, and um, Valerie, I'm sorry, not Valerie, um, Terry, our program coordinator, Ariana Heater, another one of our part-time uh, coordinators, they are going to, and with, with Valerie as well, she's going to take some of these responsibilities, but they're going to, between those three specifically, are going to divide up responsibilities, take some off uh, Valerie's plate, allowing her to be uh, be very intentional in expanding our Spanish programs. Um, so with that, um, making sure that we're providing opportunities to have roundtables and discussions with our current patrons. How do we bring in new uh, patrons for these conversations? That the, the outreach that we're talking about, bringing uh, uh, bringing the, bringing the right voices to the table to identify what our needs are moving forward, allowing Valerie to uh, be intentional. So hear, hearing them out and uh, identifying what programs we want to implement moving forward. So it's going to be a slow process because you know right now number one she's taking over Spanish programs. Um, that's been that's a process on its own and. From there, developing relations with our current patrons who are involved in these programs. Um, trust has to be developed and established before we do anything, right? Uh, you know, a big part of what we're looking through that cultural piece. We develop those positive relationships first, to develop that trust, and um, from there, build our programs. So it's not going to happen overnight. It's not a, okay, we got a new programmer, we're going to throw in 10 new Spanish programs, done, problem fixed. But again, when I, when I say we want to be intentional, we, we already have uh, classes and programs around nutrition that looks different culturally for our, Hispanic, our, our, our Latino population, right? So we, again, uh, intentional programming. 
Uh, it doesn't mean just having one of our current around um, nutrition, uh, having a, a bilingual presenter with them to translate that. Again, we need to be specific on what the needs are if we were to offer these specific, um, well, these targeted programs that have been identified in these conversations. So uh, it's going to be a slow process. Uh, I'm working with Amy Hodger, program supervisor right now, to identify that timeline, which I'll come to the board um, uh, probably in the next month or so to, well, probably in the next month um, in, in February to identify our timeline of this process. Um, identifying where we want to have these roundtable discussions, how we're going to outreach, um, when we want to have programs implemented. I, you know, maybe it might be summer, it might be fall, we don't know yet, right? Uh, but again, uh, growing it from the ground up. Instead of saying, this is what we think, we need to know what, what the need is before we do anything, right? We don't want to be, um, we don't want to just be reactive. We want to be proactive in this process. So that, that, that is our goal. That, that's great. Uh, you know, one of the things, um, and, and this is just something I'm off because working at, at the restaurant, there's, a, there's several, uh, and, and most of the time it's been Hispanics, that go in there and say, listen, uh, I have a family member just passed away, we're trying to get into Mexico. And, uh, you know, so we need some kind of a plan that, I mean, you know, think about something like, I don't know what you would call it, death and dying or something like that. That's a reality that, folks, you need to save a little bit of money every month, you know, if you can. Yeah. Because you don't wait until the person is in that state and then you just say, hey, we need money to get them out there. Right? And, and, and then totally understanding the difference between a cost for an autopsy versus a full play funeral. Not an autopsy, uh, yeah. cremation versus a uh, uh, full spectrum, but you know something like that. But I mean, we would want to hear from them. The only reason I brought that up is because I there are several that want to put a jar in there, which the, the, cor the corporation uh, corporate will not allow them to do that. Doesn't allow them to put signs on their windows or things like that uh, dealing with fundraisers or anything like that. You know, I, I think there's that, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of others that, that need to be involved. And the, the, here's a question that I know Maria left, I guess, but uh, like with Maria, who, who is willing to volunteer, uh, does she, I mean, how, I, I didn't, I don't know if she knows who to contact or whatever to let them know she can still do whatever needs to be done to kind of help in that area also. So there's a process for our, our uh, volunteers to be vetted to do this work. Um, you basically have to gain HR clearance to allow our volunteers to do the work that they do. So um, right now we're at over 100, over 300 volunteers. Um, wow. Some do a lot more intentional work than others, but we have a total of over 300 volunteers at this time uh, in different capacities and in different spaces uh, for, for to support our needs. Um, but uh, you know, so that, that information is communicated out in our bill as well on um, that process. But right now, just applications are closed. But um, how do we get that information out there? Uh, you know, we can, we can. Um, it, it's on our website. It is in our bill, and we do have a lot of those conversations we have now. People who just stop in and say, "Hey, I'm interested in volunteering." You know, well, how do I do that? And so, but there's different things. I mean, it might need, not be that forward-facing volunteer work. Um, we have our, um, well, John, do you care to speak to volunteer support you yeah, Is that okay? Sorry, put John. Sure. In the spot. Uh, peer support here in the center is available to seniors. Across, we're having difficulties with grief, grief support or isolation. We haven't been able to face anybody, but particularly seniors. And the outreach that Ronnie's group does with them and the training that we receive is pretty impressive. And we, uh, meet here at the center, to talk to people, we meet in their homes if they need help. Um, but what I'm finding in, in the process is that the people who know about it know about it, but there's a lot of people who don't. Right. And I keep hearing issues here about how we communicate, how we get the information out to the community, all of the community. Um, even the people who aren't seniors and tell their family members and what have you. That's the one thing that I've heard occasionally here today. How do we get, we do great services, but who, who knows about it? Eight, nine thousand people come here a month. 
that's the typical population. How do we, how do we deal with that? The peer support group is incredibly well supported by staff. So the communication, thank, thank you. And so that communication piece, we are looking to be able to establish through our uh, improving our website. Uh, we just started Facebook up, Facebook up again. Uh, once we get these things, it's been a slow process. Facebook just started up. From there, we're gonna look at doing um, better advertising through our 50 Clubs Marketplace. Um, but we need, again, staff and time to do a lot of these things. So that's why it's been a slow process. But we're slowly getting that momentum on improving our communication out to our community uh, as well. For either of you, um, sometimes I get complaints and it, through social media, right? I'm like that unofficial city council Facebook lurker. And um, uh, the, I, I don't know whether this is accurate or not because sometimes, especially when they're not on the record, people will say anything just to vent their anger. But is there a long waiting list to get peer support? No. No, there's a, there's a pretty detailed uh, screening process to make sure mm -hmm. people have a needs and they need professional help beyond what we can offer as volunteers, that type of thing. The screening may take a little while. I know that some of the support staff are seven weeks out on some of the things they're having to do, just because there's such a demand. Mm -hmm. But I think if people have a, have a complaint, they should bring it, bring right. it forward so it can be addressed. Most of just want to complain and not move it forward. But there is, is, as John mentioned, so there is a wait. Um, you know, but it's weeks, not months. It, it can be, it can be anywhere from four to six weeks. Um, mm -hmm. That that is that is the right. reality based on um, our, our staffing needs right now, our, our staffing right now. So um, you know, rate with, so identifying that as a need, that is going to be one of my focuses for for the budget for budget for twenty twenty five. Is identifying how well not only the need but in our statistics if we're at four to six uh, four to six week wait list right now what impact can one if not two additional staff members for uh, supportive services do can it can that knock our wait list down to two weeks or three weeks or just mm -hmm. provide a quicker turnaround Let's, how many more uh, um, uh, clients can we take on that right because the staff trains more peer support counselors yes how long does it take to train a peer support counselor. Eight weeks. Eight weeks. Eight weeks. So you won't make any difference for eight weeks. Um, well, the biggest issue that we had was when the staffing turnover had occurred early mm -hmm. in the year or late last year. And I went away and responded to that, got the staffing up, I think relatively quickly. At that point, we were provided to four to six weeks out. When yeah. that number's come down, the extra staffing is yes, coming. Yes, that is true. So, but they respond as quickly as they can from what I've seen. I have heard nothing but good things from people who are in the program. So that is a, a real a real point of praise. I have one other question since we're on the subject. You know, uh, what is the escape valve? You know, if you call a mental health provider, they will, they will always have a recording that says, if you are a mental health emergency, call hang up and call 911. Mm -hmm. And, um, does the peer support counseling system have an escape valve for like referring people to mental health process, partners or something, you know, whoever we can do with the city on that? To, to refer them for emergency yeah, support for services. Yeah, for emergency support services. Yeah. So, um, you know, if it is a, if, if basically the communication is that we cannot wait uh, a four to six week, four to six weeks out, and you need that support sooner than, you know, the, the communication is missing mm -hmm. from the emergency support. Um, but I wanted to go back to peer support volunteers. So that is actually who's on our go cover this year is, is honoring and recognizing um, our, our peer support volunteers and the work that they do. Um, so what they do is, you know, allows us, as John mentioned, is that there's that assessment process to identify what their needs are. And if it's something that our volunteers can take on, then they take them on as um, a client, client work group. And then it allows um, our staff to focus on the um, additional needs of, of, of other other clients, if, if that makes sense. So being able to differentiate what the needs are, and, and decide from there who, who will be able to provide the supports um, for, for those individuals. So it's a great system. It's a great program. We have great volunteers. Uh, we have an office for them in the back. 
that they they schedule out their appointments that they make. That they so they basically reserve the room for their appointments um, each, each week out. And so um, nothing but positive thing. I've also heard nothing but positive things about this support that we provide as well. And just I'm very thankful for our volunteers to 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 give us those additional supports because as mentioned, you know, because of that wait list, we can't get to everybody. Um, but anyway, so we're back to our need is for 2020. Uh, five, I am going to be spending time to focus on identifying that need again, but framing it as a, as a need and necessity and not, not a want or an ask, right? I mean, our, again, our community is growing. That we, this can continue to, to grow additional weeks out, farther weeks out, and we just want them to be able to provide us support sooner rather than later. So, again, looking at the data, how many people for our, our, our current staff, how many people are we seeing a week, a month? And if we were to add one to two more staff members, what does that reduce the, the, the wait list to? Can we say so maybe a week or two weeks out versus that extended hours would make yeah. a difference too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Lots of people can't do it during my Sorry. 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 Go ahead. Oh, that I was just affirming what Arlene said. <laughs> oh okay. Sorry. Didn't mean to speak out of turn. I just do it. That's okay. <laughs> 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 That is a report that they're creating for the participation of peer support. And that's what Kim was getting our numbers of hours. Yeah. So they're working on that for the annual report. Which okay. I don't have we'll that get there. Yeah. Okay. I have a quick question. So they have the same stages in Spanish or only in English? Yes, Spanish as well. Spanish? Yep. So we have uh, two resource support volunteers, I don't know, not just very specials, who, who um, are, are, are bilingual. Yeah, I was wondering because I take her mom for five years. So she passed away last year and she was 95. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she was living with me the last five years. Yeah. So my baby died in 92. And then she was, one of my brothers were taking care. And do you know, men can take care of women's daughter. So they bring me here to cover up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good mm -hmm. questions. Okay. Uh, unless there's any other questions. Uh, let's move on to uh, discussing the 2024 annual report. We have about 35 minutes left, and we just want to make sure we get through the agenda here. So, who's going to be talking about the annual report? Okay. I will look to you, but me. Take your good books and turn to uh, bylaws, city ordinance, tab, second page. I mentioned earlier we have an annual report that we submit to the City Council and if you look under powers and duties that's basically the guideline that we're going to be following as far as our recommendations. Everybody with me? Okay. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if we'll follow it just exactly A, B, C, D, but those are the kinds of areas that we'll make our recommendations in. I wanted to say, Ronnie, that uh, Brandy has been making that, that annual report, I think, for years. And I'd like to see her keep doing that because I think there's a lot of useful information in that, too. So, uh, you know, if you could uh, consider that. Yeah. So. Uh, anyway, the uh, you can see for yourself just to just to go over this. This is old stuff to some of you, but this is mainly for the new people. Uh, we have our part of our responsibility is uh, item A to re establish recommendations for guidelines and policies. Uh, B to review annual budget requests relating to senior citizen programs. C serve as liaison between the city council and the community of senior citizens. And D, to report annually in writing concerning the operation of the senior center and really any other matters of relevance, I think is what it boils down to. So I think the way this is written, we have a lot of latitude on the, on the kinds of things that we would want to recommend. Um, Penny? Yes. I think it needs to say in writing and in person. Oh. Possibly. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, in a particular place here or? D, to report annually. 
in writing. Oh, yeah, right. And in person, that way that would be in front of the city council. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but yes, yeah. I think everybody agrees that maybe we should make a presentation uh, on the order of what uh, uh, mm -hmm. Marsha was describing, mm -hmm. and get some people there, and uh, maybe have two, three speakers. I don't know how we want to do that. We can talk about that later. But anyway, to have as much impact, you know, city the city manager, a written report, and a, a show of force before the city council, all of those things, I think, are, are important to make an impact. And I think part of the reason, I've, I've mentioned before that this, the, the staff here just stayed around 10 people for years and years, and I think part of it was that's kind of low profile. Everybody thought it was really good. Everybody's really satisfied with it, but it was kind of low profile. So anyway, I'm, I'm saying that we need to make kind of a splash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we don't make a splash, we're going to get ignored. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Art, I want you to go make the splash. <laughs> <laughs> we're good at it. So anyway, that's kind of the overall framework of what the annual report is going to look like. And uh, we'll work on that later. Like I say, I'll, I will probably bring some kind of a draft next, next time. Uh, but it'll be just a draft, and we'll add and subtract to it. And if everybody then could have their initial report, so to speak, ready to go. Um, okay, uh, let's all read out a good book. Um, the, a new survey regarding basic services. Again, this is mainly for the new people. <clears throat> We've had. Uh, We've had three or four service uh, surveys over the last couple of years, and they all show pretty much the same thing, is that people are very satisfied in what they report as far as the services, as far as the programs are concerned. Um, exercise and fitness programs are always right up there. Uh, classroom, uh, classroom presentation classes, that, that's always up there. Uh, but so the, the, the three or four surveys that we've had tend to come out about the same. The last one we had was much, much better done. It was done by the marketing section of the city, and they did a very good job. But it was focused primarily on, on programs. And it just, again, affirmed that your <coughs> staff is doing a really good job and has for a long, long time. That's on programs. But, there is a but. And the but is, now, let me back up a minute. When I uh, was approached about being on the board, uh, one of the first things I did was to uh, look up the, some information on the city and the programs and the divisions and that sort of thing. And at the, the idea of equity permeates the, the, the city literature. You know, Equity is a big deal with the city. As a matter of fact, most most meetings have that pre emblem, you know, saying about the, uh, is it the Arapaho tribe and the, the, the Indian lands? So, I mean, there's a real commitment to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to equity, I, I think, in the city. That really appealed to me. And I read through some of the strategic plans, and equity as far as senior services is also important. And that's, that's where I think we could maybe do something a little bit different. And I said that the programs as is and the people that come into this, into this uh, uh, building are, are, are satisfied, that's not it. What about other basic services that I'm getting at? We have a community, uh, and I don't remember the exact percentages, but you know it's roughly 80% white, 25% Hispanic, 2-3% black, and some other, other groups. And I'm not sure whether or not low income, uh, that's, that's a significant area, those over 85, that kind of thing. You can slice and dice it different ways. I guess the thing is, you can draw a, you can create a profile of the community. Do the services that we provide match that profile? That's the question. And granted, we do a good job not leaving that job. Ronnie and his staff are doing a good job. But are we meeting 
in an equitable fashion all of the things that people in our community need and want. That's my issue. So that's why that's why I'm thinking that we need another survey. And you know, I get tired of doing surveys all the time, I really do, but sometimes it's the only way to get information. There has been some resistance, quite frankly, and, and legitimate about resistance to collecting information about your about the clientele and, and, and that, that you have because of confidentiality, uh, people being afraid that they're going to be targeted somehow and, and that sort of thing. It's, and that's all legitimate. But I'm thinking if we could get the uh, city marketing division, I mean, the same, it's the same people, you know, you know, get them to uh, do a survey, but not so much on programs, but on basic kinds of services, you know, like I made a list, of, like an arbitrary list I made up. You know, if the focus on not on programs, but on things like health, transportation, housing, information, caregiving, counseling, finance, abuse, all of those kinds of things. The idea would be to get a representative cross-section sample. I don't know how that would work exactly, but, and I don't know what the response rate would be. It's tough to get a good response rate sometimes, but they had a pretty good response to, to, to the last one that you did. Anyway. Yeah, I'm sorry about the kicking the purse. Um, anyway, it would be designed something like we have an area like the transportation. Now, granted, we have lots of transportation programs, but is transportation a problem for a particular group that should be served and isn't? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. What if you have a person that's Hispanic, for example? that has a problem with depression and also has a problem with caregiving and they don't have a car and they can't hardly get out of their, their, own, their own home. So is, is, is that an area, I'm just making this up, but is that something that we want to focus on? Are they people being missed even though what we're doing at the center is wonderful? You get my point? So. I'm saying that the people that did the marketing in the survey would focus on trying to get a cross section, like they said, and they go through these different areas and maybe have a Likert scale, a five point scale. Like uh, health is a, is a very serious problem to me or a member of my family. That would be like a five. And on the other end, it would be it's of no consequence to me, or, you know, however you want to define that scale. You go through these different areas, and then you, you get some sort of a measure. That way. Okay, then, so what do you do with it? And what I would think that you want to do with it <clears throat> is Ronnie and his staff, or maybe you and Harold or Christina or whoever, you know, your managing people, you know, you take, uh, let's say that the highest rank need out there is not what we would expect that it might be, but it might be something like uh, uh, abuse. I, I don't know if that's a good category or not, but abuse is, is a really big problem. Okay, and then do you have, do you have the staff that you need? You have the money, you have the budget, you have the resources to plan and to reach those people have that kind of a problem. So, that, that this is not easy stuff. You know. So, your task would be to define what you would do during the year. Okay, you've identified the problem by group, how important the issue is by group, hopefully. And then you devise a plan of what they're going to do, specific activities, programs, whatever, that meet that particular need. And then at the end of the year, you evaluate how you did. And that's how we measure how we go, how we're going to go through from time period to time period. So, you know, this is all kind of new. I don't know whether 
I see some people nodding their head and some people looking hmm, crazy. Um, so well, I, I guess I, I'm, how do we define what the role of the senior center is as compared to those things on your list? And what the senior is. Yeah. And the what? And what? The, sorry. Go ahead. And what the city offers it. If senior services doesn't offer uh, support on abuse, which mm -hmm. I think we do to some yeah. extent, yeah. but how do we connect people to that service somewhere else in the community? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly, but it goes back to your referral, your support services staff. That would be something that they need to be aware of and so they can make the, the kind of referrals that they need if you don't have the resources and the time yourself. Is that, what, is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm not saying that you pick up and solve all these problems. <laughs> no. Especially housing. Transportation. <laughs> 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 so, you know, that's, it's a way to make movement. If someone asked me to describe how you do, what kind of progress you've made in these different areas and basic services over this last year, I couldn't tell them. And you know, I would like to know, as a board member, I would like to know, so I can make recommendations to the city council, to Harold, to anybody else that's listening. You know? So this is not easy stuff. It's simple, you know. It's simple enough. To find the need, find a program, and evaluate it. I mean, it's simple enough, but doing it is, is, is a little more difficult. So this is the kind of thing that I think we want to do as far as to get to your issue part is how do we do outreach? We have to kind of define where we go, what kind of outreach we do. We do outreach where we need to Yeah, so. And it, it's, it's going to be a long process. No, oh, this is not something to do all the night, no. Marcia and uh, Jeff both had their hand up. Oh, I was just going to add that what Dave is describing is a no wrong door strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, <clears throat> it, it basically means uh, things like uh, at, at some point the senior center, which is likely to be the first contact for a lot of a certain, yeah. certain groups, yeah. um, it gets better at referring people to the um, police team is associated with domestic abuse because it's a it's a priority for them and elder abuse is domestic abuse um, so uh, we might have some expertise or we might not uh, in the uh, Longmont economic development partners because they use the software and, and a lot of different techniques for implementing no wrong door um, for entrepreneurs startups in the community. It's not a different problem, it's just a different space. So uh, I just wanted to point that out, that it has a name and and essentially when you're saying how do you do metrics, you know, you have counters, you have counters on the arcs of the graph so that when you make a referral you count that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there could be a, a different time for talking about it. Yeah, that, that's something a little further on down the line, but that's the idea. That, that would be the idea. Then, some one another idea that's had some resistance. Uh, I don't know how you folks feel about it, and that's uh, to to narrow the subgroups down by the the survey that was done just lately. That was broken out by age. Well, it sure would be helpful if we had a breakout by sex, income level. Race, those would be the big ones. So, and I know there's some resistance, like I said, within the staff. Some people just don't like to do that because they feel it's invasive. But lots of people, lots of organizations do it. Census Bureau does it. <laughs> uh, but there's, that, that's something that I would leave in the hands of, you know, if, if that's a recommendation we want to make, that's something that the, the marketing people could work out. Maybe they'd want an attorney's opinion. You know, I don't know how, how far you can go. Um, 
collecting in, in, that information on the survey, I think, wouldn't be a problem because they're all would be anonymous and you're not at the senior center. But once you get to the senior center and providing services, that's a different animal. So, I mean, that, that, there's some work. This, this is just an overall big picture idea. But that's the sort of thing that I would like to recommend. And I don't know if we would not need to put this on the agenda for next month to continue yes. with some of this mm -hmm. as yes. to what we're doing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm and uh, so, yeah. is there any other questions? If, if not, I'd like to go ahead and, sure. and move on to uh, Ronnie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to text um, Teresa. So, we have. Uh, We, I want to introduce one of our new staff members, uh, Teresa Melvin, our front office receptionist. She started with us uh, a few weeks back, and um, just wanted to. Do you want me to go get her? Uh, I got it covered. Okay. <laughs> I right. told him to keep her, her going back. Okay. And so I'll bring her up here in a second, but also did want to announce that Terry Calvin did accept our um, recreation pro program coordinator position, and so she's officially starting. She's been with us in a part-time capacity, helping us since um, since the summer. Uh, but she's officially starting in this role next Monday, uh, full time. So excited to have 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 Terry keeping her on her team and um, that team just their, their their chemistry. It takes it takes time to to build chemistry and learn other people's um, work, I'll say work habits, <laughs> right? To support each other and the, the that team of four back there is just clicked immediately and they just I mean our programs. I said it from the very beginning, our programs don't suffer, but they definitely have not suffered. And they've introduced uh, new ideas um, uh, um, into, into our program, things that we've never even done before. And you know, I'm just hearing nothing but positive feedback from everybody who attends our CEPs, cultural enrichment programs, and our day trips as well. So uh, just fantastic team. And I'm glad we're keeping Terry, Terry with us. Um, we, at the end of the year, our team kind of meant to identify goals for 20, 2024, so I just want to share the board that we're working on crafting it. We've identified our goals for 2024 and our foundation around culture. Um, and what do, what do we stand for, basically? What do we, as a senior center staff member, what is it we stand for in our community? So we're going to start unpacking that, develop goals for 2024 based off of those responses, and, and start um, using that to align for uh, everything we do. This, this coming year. Tommy, are you going to present that to the board so that we can have goals that... Yeah, want to get there, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're just in the... I mean, we, we, we jumped in this office, this whole whiteboard... Or this office, this room. This whole whiteboard was full of um, of notes, so we're reflecting on this past year. So last year's goals that were uh, established and kind of seeing where we, where we fell uh, in the process. Did we meet these goals? Uh, did we achieve them? Do we need to carry these over to 2024? And then setting that, those foundational goals for 2024. So it's still, um, we just have pictures of all those notes and we're gonna start crafting it together and pulling it together to identify measurable goals. So once I have that, absolutely, I'll, I'll present that to the board. Uh, our two uh, CEPs, we had two December CEPs, our holiday soiree. Uh, we had 132 participants, which was sold out. We had a wait list for that. Uh, 132 in attendance, and our Happy New Year, um, which was 120 participants and also sold out again. So, um, what's the CEP? Cultural Enrichment Program. Mm -hmm. So for our new board members, our Cultural Enrichment Program is uh, events that are funded by our Friends Board. So we've, our goal is to do one a month, and it's free for anybody um, who, who uses the Senior Center, and you just have to sign up for it. Of course, there's um, limited capacity. And so we do it, it different things. From uh, one of these was a uh, live band. So we had a live band here with um, some drinks and snacks. Um, there's been things done in the past where somebody comes into storytelling, uh, magician, <laughs> things like that. So just fun programs. So we have one coming up next week that I'll be leading. Um, Mayor Peck will be in attendance on that one, um, and it's it's going to be around. And you're more than welcome to attend as well. Is Around, um, around the work that we have done from the youth side with Sister Cities, but the work we are doing as, as a senior center to, to partner with the Mormon Arapaho tribe in Wyoming. 
and so work towards an elder exchange. So we're going to share the Sister Cities video here in the in the gymnasium, and then have a Q and A after. Uh, again, myself will be there to talk about the work that we're doing towards the elder exchange. Uh, Mayor Peck um, talking about uh, the now land acknowledgement that exists here in the city of Longmont, and also share her experiences going down to Wyoming to uh, connect with Northern Arapaho leadership as well. Um, we have three, I'll say three, of our uh, Sister Cities representatives coming in, two, one with the city, two with the city, and one at, who is on our Friends Board to kind of share their experience doing this work um, with, with the youth, getting us to where we are right now. So, so thanks Teresa. So this is Teresa Melvin. She started with us a couple weeks back. She is our new uh, front office receptionist. And uh, this is our advisory board. And I just wanted to introduce you, <laughs> Teresa. And you let them know who you are. Hi, I'm Teresa Melvin. I've been, uh, let's see, I lived in Longmont for 10 years, and now I'm living in Firestone for the last 14. So I know the area pretty well. And I am so happy. And I gotta tell you, I love what you're doing. The Senior Center mission is pretty amazing. I, this is such a neat community, and the services and resources that this place offers are outstanding. So I'm very happy to be here and be part of this community now. Really, it's pretty cool. Um, if I can help you in any way, I may be a little slow at first, but I'm happy to be there. So please Thank let you. me know. You're welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. Happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> cool, cool stuff. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Good to meet you. Good to meet you all. I'll I'll have to ask your name several times. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have that presentation um, next week. And uh, just very excited for that, just to introduce you know, this work that we'll, uh, to our community, mm -hmm. the work we're doing, and where we want to go with this. So what's been done on the youth, what's been accomplished on the youth side, and how we want that to transition and carry over to our, our, our senior side. So. And what is the video? That is. Uh, that's okay. That is next week. It is on Thursday, the 11th, uh, from 2.30 to 4. The 11th from 2.30 to 4. Okay. Sorry, I didn't have that on top of my head. That's okay. I have a lot of other things. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> so very excited about that one, though. It's been, it's been, a, it's, it's been a, a lot of work, and it's, it's worth it. It's worthwhile, and I'm just excited to share that with you. With, with our community. So, um, our Go magazine has arrived for December through February, which we have in here in, the, in your in your uh, pack in your binders. And our Spring Go has submitted for print, so we're getting ready to, to, to get our solidify our Spring Go uh, catalog coming up. Day trip departures have launched uh, last month in December from Lashley Street Station, so we're excited that. We're officially utilizing that space um, and, and being meaningful with it. So we're not just doing a program here or there. That is our new hub, our new location for all of our day trips. We have a nice big parking lot, um, and it, we're just we're just able. Sometimes we come here when we have a lot of programs going on. This parking lot is just very jam packed. So when we have those day trips where they're gone from uh, eight a.m. till five p.m., and we have a charter bus that carries fifty plus people, right? And that's 30 vehicles in our parking lot. Uh, that leaves whoever's coming for our, our day programs here, our classes here, to park over in recreation and walk all the way down. So it just helps alleviate some of that congestion. But again, having that central location for where all of our trips depart as well is, um, uh, is very important. Right? We, we've identified that space for that uh, purpose. It's going well. Uh, of course, there's, there, there's some, we're hearing a lot of feedback. Which, which, which only allows us to get better in what we're doing. So we're taking that feedback into consideration and, um, and identifying what requests I need to make moving forward as well for, for budget for um, 2025 as well to make some, some improvements, if that makes sense. Lighting, lighting's an issue over there. So. Like in the parking lot? Yeah, yeah, just a little. And when it's dark at night? Yeah, yeah. So we just want more. The engineering? We just want more lights. We're getting there. We're getting there. This is it's just it just launched uh, in December, so we're getting there. Collecting some feedback, so we know who we can go to for what and see what what, what uh, adjustments we can make pretty quickly. 
Um, we're, we're excited for that change for sure. Um, I don't want to take too much time because we have four other reports. Yeah. So with that information, does anyone have any questions for me? I've had a lot to say already. Um, so yeah, just reiterate, um, I do think being vocal about the portability of the senior homestead exemption is a really good thing. Um, this board could, for example, write a letter to our um, senator and representatives for Longmont in support of it. There's no reason why you can't do it. Um, you can also make a request to the council to write a letter in support of the portability of the senior exemption. Um, I don't know why any seniors voted against HH because there were a lot of uh, lots of disinformation around that. But I mean, I voted for it just because of the senior exemption. Yeah, because the rest of it you couldn't understand. But everybody can understand that, and that's the that's the piece that we really need, because um, uh, uh, yeah. So I think I always try to talk about the ways that this board can use the power of use its power and the power of the council to get the right things done. And I'm looking forward to the new year. Thank you. Go ahead. Can we come up with a draft letter that we can use? all hmm. send something you know and then you give us contact information on who to send it to to make it as easy as possible and then people could personalize it somehow but at least we get the right information in the letter and who are we thinking about as far as drafting that i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know but i know the I, I ins and outs enough to uh to draft a letter like that, but someone could make an appointment with Sandy Cedar and ask for her advice. Okay, because she is our legislative liaison, mm -hmm. and she wouldn't draft the letter for you, but she could probably um, give help us give you the facts. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, we follow up on that. Cedar. 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 She's Cedar. an assistant Cedar. city Cedar. manager. Cedar. She wants to give you a oh, heads no. up that okay. uh, we're having connection issues, so the the computer might die. <laughs> Okay, and uh, Lonnie said she would go ahead and follow through with this. Uh, area aging on uh, area agency on aging. Who's uh, well, as said, yeah. okay, go ahead, Lonnie. Well, yeah, I sent the report. Um, we basically we had it in Lafayette, and uh, they recently renovated their senior center, so there was a lot of talk about that. And then they talked a lot about. Um, um, they talked a lot about their upcoming recruitment, um, and who's going to stay on the board and who's not. Um, I wish I had access to my report. I'm sorry, I don't. But I did include it, so if anybody would like to get more information. And again, there's a big thing on, on uh, prop, the Proposition H, um, Proposition HH. Um, they talked about Sister Carmen community supporting and serving older, uh, younger and older adults in the community. And there's a web page that you can look at. Um, and this is um, a prepared. A statement on what happened with Proposition H8, what was done in special session. Um, uh, Lindsay has contacted um, some people about any proposed legislation around uh, around legislation, I say, around portability of the tax exemption, and uh, she'll follow up with that information. So that she'll be another resource that I can go to and find out exactly um, where it's at. Um, along with the letter that I'm going to be drafting. So, um, she definitely put in what bills passed during the special session. So if you want to go in and click on the links, you can read all the different things that were passed during the special session, such as emergency rental assistant grant program, increased income, earned income tax credit, summer electronic benefits transfer program, property tax relief, um, and so on. 
It also, I, I added a link that showed uh, kind of a overall consolidation of what happened um, during the um, special session in November. Um, so they are going through recruitment. Re um, recruitment one runs through January 19th. So if anybody's interested in getting involved with the Boulder County Agents Area Agency on Aging, please let me know and I can point you towards the right person to talk to and to contact. Um, and Caitlin from the Association for Community Living did a presentation. Um, the link is was included, is included. Um, and basically it was several aspects of living in a community where disabilities are embraced. Um, and she did at her presentation and several resources that she shared. And that's it. Questions? Uh, you know, I know people are busy, so if you need to leave, we can definitely understand. But if we can, uh, if there's anything we can uh, table to the next meeting, but if uh, somebody in the friends wants to. So that was Sheila, and she did not attend this last meeting. Okay. Dave got that notification too late. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but really all they did is identify two new board members. Okay. Um, there wasn't too much missed. Right now they're reviewing our proposed uh, budget for, for, for the senior center for next year. And so they just spend a lot of time and energy reviewing those line items. So. They've been invited to attend our next meeting. What's that? Friends, they've been invited to attend the next meeting. Okay. New, new, new president, um, Chuck Bueller, and um, previous president, uh, Linda Fetterman. So they, they, they've confirmed that? They have, yes. Sustainability? Uh, it's getting late, so I'll only say, I, I included the report. I didn't summarize it because I just had a hell of a time typing. <laughs> well, I just gave you the report. One thing I want to highlight, though, is something that's going to be a big issue, in my opinion. Last This year, this last year, was the hottest on record. Next year, according to the experts, is going to be worse. Heat mitigation is going to be a problem in the future, particularly the group of people I was talking about before. So uh, I have nothing specific right now to suggest, but that's something we need to track, and it's going to become an issue. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Engaging, caring communities, who says? I, I don't think they've been meeting that group. I don't I don't think we have anything. I don't, know. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I moved from the board. Is this a new business or what? Any new business or yeah. what, what, what do we buy? If anybody has any comments, they okay. have board members. Okay. Anybody have any comments? Any questions? Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. So, all in favor? Okay. okay. Thank you, folks. I appreciate you coming and excuse the went over just a couple of minutes, which is not bad.